Um, yes, musing on my habitation, musing on my heavenly home. I, I like that word musing. What does that mean? What's that? To think, yes, but it's more than think, isn't it? It's pondering. It's really thinking, yes? To muse means to really settle on something in your thinking. Musing on my habitation, which is what we need to do. What's a habitation? You know, habitat for humanity. What's a habitation? Place of dwelling. Yeah, it's a place of dwelling. Good. Uh, my heavenly home. I'm musing on my heavenly home, not just this one, which we can become so fixated on. I love that Sal, how old are you, Sally? 22. She's a 22 year old already feeling homesick. That's unusually mature. Um, it's hard to feel homesick when you feel so young and immortal and with so much of your life in ahead of you. It's a lot easier to think about heaven when you're closer to it, at least in your statistical estimations. But none of us has a guarantee we'll make it past today. So, uh, and relatively speaking, this life is just a little blip compared to eternity. And so, so even though this may feel like a long life, we need to be people who think about our, our home to come. Musing on my habitation, musing on my heavenly home, fills my soul with holy longings. The most mature Christians are homesick people. Um, we have got to have a homesickness, knowing how far from this world, uh, far this world is from how it should be and will be one day. We should be filled with holy longings. And then, come my Jesus, quickly come. Sally, why do you say my Jesus? You say that's something you say frequently? Yeah, I just started saying it recently. I don't really know where it came from. Um, it's just like a tenderness. Like, I remember I was talking to one of my friends in high school, and we were talking about the Lord for her husband, and she was on her like, way to go and um, got to go with the Lord. But she was just talking to me about like, being a Christian. Like, mm. yeah, like God just shows up to us. But God is not going to Good. Uh, yeah, I like the, the affirmation of the present personal presence of Christ in that. Um, yeah, come, my Jesus, quickly come. So we long for the return of Christ in light of this world being filled with vanity so often. I don't know if there's a book more relevant to a postmodern culture than Ecclesiastes. <laughs> Talking all the time about, you look around, everything's vanity. It's empty. It's chasing after wind. You know, you think about those London riots. And the way people were going after flat screen televisions and kicking in windows for stuff. Because they live in a culture that tells them that that's where life is found. Um, it's, and it's empty. You get it home and what do you have? A flat screen TV and nothing more. You don't have life. It's empty. If, if all you have is... As Ecclesiastes says, life under the sun, all you've got is vanity, emptiness. And so, so this world, disconnected from the things of heaven, it, are empty. Uh, Lord, I long to be with thee. We're starting to preach through Colossians at our church this week, and it's got that amazing line, set your mind on things above. And then you've got that phrase, have you ever heard that expression? He's too heavenly minded to be any earthly good. That's an evil expression, <laughs> as if that's ever our problem. We're just too heavenly minded. We just think about heaven and things of eternity more than we should. <laughs> as if that's ever a problem. Now, you can do it in a way that it doesn't make you more meaningfully involved and fruitful in this world, but that's not being heavenly minded. That's not setting your mind on things above. Uh, but, yeah, good. All right, other thoughts you had as we went through it? Gene? Okay. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Good. Good, good, good. Good. Right, 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 right. Excellent. You bring to surface 
a biblical, once again, a biblical tension paradox. It, Sally points us to one where we should be so profoundly, meaningfully involved in this very good creation, but always with a longing for heaven. But I, I am so glad you bring that out, Gene, because there should be a sense where we always have an increasing hunger for God. But wouldn't you also say that we should experience profound satisfaction in Him? Yeah, so it's both, isn't it? It's both. We want to at the same time. God is the one who, when you're satisfied in Him, you have an increased hunger. Um, and so I, so I think you're absolutely right that, that this satisfaction we talk about here isn't something that ends a hunger, while at the same time it's a profound satisfaction. So I think it's both. I think it's both. Thanks for, for uh, that qualification, though. Yeah, good. Good. And I love that Gene says, you know what? I, want, I know we're trying to appreciate this hymn, but I want to disagree with it, if I, too. Please, I, I love that way of thinking. This isn't just let's all agree. This isn't just let's all uh, appreciate. Sometimes let's differ. I, I, I love that. Okay, good. Other thoughts? That struck, struck you. Question. Go ahead, Amy. Two flags forward, aim at the word dragon. Yeah. Yeah, you know, maybe we better back up and, and unpack this hymn from the beginning. Eric. I was reading this one and singing this one. It kind of reminded me of the Old Testament yeah. in a lot of ways. And well, it should. Going through the wilderness. Yeah. And that he it went through this barren land, this wilderness, and went to the land yeah. of Canaan, through the desert, and all this. And I, they were weak, they, they worshiped other things. Um, but then God always provided something for them. And the bread of heaven, I think, you know, the manna coming down from heaven. Yeah. And they weren't satisfied in that. They wanted more. And it fed them, actually, a lot of more. Exactly. Guys, do you know why this hymn is dying? It requires significant biblical literacy to get it. It requires significant Old Testament biblical literacy to get it. It requires significant ability to connect Old and New Testaments to get it, just like Eric was doing for us. Uh, it's filled with powerful salvific imagery straight out of the Bible. So we, st we start, guide me, O thou great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren land. It's so hard for Americans to hear the word pilgrim biblically, right? Because we think of guys with big black hats eating turkey. No! What's the bottom line definition of a pilgrim? Yeah, somebody who's not home, right? We're not home. And uh, we are pilgrims in a barren land. So, like, just like Eric did, what do you think of when you hear barren land? You think Exodus. You think the wilderness, wanderings. You, you think of Israel on the way to the promised land, but not there yet. Right? Okay, so, pilgrim through the barren land. A, a sojourner, a, an alien, somebody who's not home. You need to be able to relate to a pilgrim. I know... You're from a town, from a country. You, you have all sorts of identifiers with things of this world. Every Christian needs to learn to identify themselves as a pilgrim, an alien, a, a sojourner, someone who's not home yet because you're not. So we are pilgrims and through this barren land. So we think of Exodus, but what does that have to do with us? We're not in the, the wilderness on the way to Israel, are we? Yeah, same imagery applies to us in this world. This is not just Old Testament stuff. It's, it's imagery that still clearly applies to us, pilgrim through this barren land. Well, how are we supposed to relate to a barren land? How are we in a barren land? Especially in the land of Disneyland where everything is green and never dies. What's this barren land stuff? Yeah, yeah, the world is, is, is profoundly <laughs> broken. It's barren. It, it's not bearing fruit the way it was designed to when God said, be fruitful and multiply. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Land does, does not provide. yes. Good. Good. Yes. And so the cursed, twisted world doesn't provide the fruitfulness it's intended to. 
So God's people, salt and light, are the ones who are starting to show this fruitfulness that this fallen, cursed world lacks. But we're in a barren land. We should feel the barrenness of it. I know we are capable of filling our lives with so much stuff that it doesn't feel barren to us very often. But we've got to be people who have God's eyes in this world. And in spite of the fact that we've got lots of the things of this world, we should be able to see the emptiness of it apart from the things of eternity. So it's a barren land. You need to feel the barrenness of it. You need to feel the difficulty of it, the sting of it. I know life has imposed that on many of you in many ways. But we can forget quickly, even if we've had opportunity to remember the barrenness of it. So we are pilgrims in a barren land. And we are weak, but God's mighty. Last week, again, like we said, we are those weird people who affirm our weakness. In contrast to God's mightiness, and that's a wonderful thing to affirm when we're in relationship with Him. And then, we are weak, yes, but He's mighty, and He holds us with His powerful hand. Beautifully imagery. And then this great imagery. Bread of heaven, bread of heaven. What does that make you think of biblically? The manna in heaven. Yeah, so they're in the wilderness and God miraculously provides for them from the ground. Bread of heaven. He provides miraculously. He sustains them. He nourishes them with the bread of heaven, the manna. And again, making the connection to the New Testament, to the gospel, Eric mentioned this. Who's the bread of heaven? Jesus is, right? He's from Beit Lechem, Bethlehem, the house of bread. And he says, I'm the bread from heaven. I'm the manna from heaven. Uh, eat of me and you'll never hunger again. Drink the water I provide and you'll never thirst again. So there it is. We, we don't lack ever a hunger, but we have a satisfaction in the midst of it. And then feed me till I want no more. See, he's the bread of heaven. And then the next thing is, continues the same imagery throughout the whole hymn. Open now the crystal fountain whence the healing stream doth flow. What do you think that's talking about? The rock, yes. The water came out of rock. It's like God said, where's the least likely place water will come from? <laughs> Where there will be no doubt that it was a miraculous, divinely provided source. A rock, that's it. And water comes out of a rock, and it's a healing stream. And again, connecting to the new covenant, Jesus says, Lady, I can offer you water, and you'll never thirst again. I will, I will give you water that will cause streams of living water to flow out of you. You become a source of living water once you drink my water. And so he is the healing stream. So we don't just stay in the Old Testament divine provision. We move to the New Testament. By the way, learn to read your Bible that way. Learn to read your Bible. Yes, in context, appreciating the passage within a biblical theology context, but learn to read it like good theologians. We desperately need Christians who can do that. And then let the fire and cloudy pillar lead me all my journey through. What's that talking about? Yes, 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 yes. So they're in the wilderness. They need direction from God. And at night, it's a pillar of fire. During the day, it's a cloud guiding them. Divine guidance, divine leading, direction. Lead me all my journey through daily. Show me which path to take, which way to go. And, and notice... It's all because of who he is. It's not just means he's giving. It's himself he gives, and that is the means. Strong deliverer, strong deliverer. Be thou still my strength and shield, my protection, my source of stability throughout my life. And then when, oh, this is a beautiful image. When I tread the verge of Jordan. Another reason this hymn's dying is because it uses words like verge. Uh, yeah, yeah what is, what's the verge? What's verge? It's on the edge. And what's the Jordan? Not Michael. <laughs> what's the Jordan? Jordan River. Symbolic of what? The crossing. Yeah, the crossing. crossing. You know, what's that? Crossing into the promised land. Yeah, crossing into the promised land. So the Jordan River, river represents what then? Final steps. Yeah, final steps, but also what? Before you get to the promised land, an obstacle, right? And once you get into the promised land, what awaits you there? The Canaanites, right? The battle's not over even once you get through the Jordan. It wasn't just need to get through the Red Sea and get through the, the wilderness. Now you're on the verge of Jordan. I love this image, like the verge. You're, think about the, the toes of the Israelites with the Jordan water lapping up against their toes. And here we go again. 
We, we've been in the wilderness 40 years. We're about to finally enter the promised land, and we've got another obstacle. And this obstacle doesn't strike fear in my heart anything like what awaits me on the other side of this obstacle. Those vicious Canaanites who are evil, wicked, strong people. <laughs> Yes, good, good, good. Oh, Ben. Yes, working out our salvation with fear and trembling. This is not for the faint of heart. Exactly. And for me, guys, half the battle is knowing it's a battle. And the reason we so often get knocked over is because we're not expecting it to be a war. We're not expecting a battle. We're expecting something easy. But it's not. It is a war. It is a battle. Working out our faith with fear and trembling but always what? In the confidence God provides. Uh, when I tread the verge of Jordan, I love that, treading the verge of Jordan. See, most Christians, <laughs> treading the verge of Jordan, it's got a way of talking that actually requires thought and biblical understanding and the ability to grab an image and say, oh, that's powerful. We're treading the verge of Jordan. We're, we're about to enter into to yet another divine provision as he opens up. Remember, he, oh, he parted the Jordan River too. It wasn't just the Red Sea parted. He parted the Jordan River and enabled them to walk through it miraculously and then to overcome the Canaanites on the other side. Bid my anxious fear subside. Help me to remember what you did to the Egyptians in the Jordan and the Red Sea and the 10 plagues and help me get through this. Bid my anxious fear subside. Boy, do we need that. We, we have an epidemic of anxiety in the church, in our society in general, but we should be so different, right? And please, if, if you deal with anxiety, I'm not putting guilt on you, I, but I do want us to have a perspective here. Bid my anxious fear subside. I even love that imagery, bid. What does it mean to bid? To dismiss, right. Bid them go. Command them to go. Bid my anxious fears subside. Like the, the waters of the Jordan subside, bid my anxious fears to subside with that Jordan water. Isn't that cool? That's really cool imagery. We have of subsiding of this, uh, this obstacle and with it goes my anxiety. Love that. Bid my anxious, goodbye anxious fears. Goodbye. Love it. Why do they subside? Because you know what God's able to do? Kill death. Ah! If he can do that, what else do you need to fear? Right? You know, I like to say and when things are bad, well, what's the worst thing that could happen? And somebody always likes to say, we could die. Right. Well, so what? God can conquer death. Death of deaths and hell's destruction. If he's got power over that, what do we fear? Where's the place for anxiety? Death of deaths and hell's destruction. Land me safe on Canaan's side. I love that. Is that great? Great imagery. And, and sadly, it'll fly over our heads when we, see, when we sing these things. And it might have for most of us when we just sang through that. Land me safe on Canaan's side. Songs of praise. Well, of course. God's divine provision leads to praise. Songs of praise is songs of praise. I will ever give to thee. What did they do when they got on the other side of the, of the Red Sea? They worshipped. Yes, they sang it. And the same thing on the other side of the Jordan. So God's provision leads to worship. That's why the gospel is a worship-producing reality for us. Uh, it's never just so we'll be safe. And please, please develop a concept of the gospel that's, that's worship-centered. Don't preach the gospel to people as only the solution to their problems. The gospel ultimately produces what? Worship to God. Glory to God. That's the reason it all happens the way it does. That's the reason he saves us. Not so we'll be safe, but so that we'll worship. Yes, safety leads to worship, but it's not the end. And yet we can, in our minds, and when we think of our own Christian lives, and when we preach the gospel to other people, just want them to be safe and say, do you have needs you have to have met? Yes, well, God can meet those needs. No, God can meet those needs, and out of that will come a worship to him, which is what you're created for. So a God-centeredness of the gospel leads to praise, leads to worship. That's the goal, not just safety. That's, that's why, you know, a radio station, a Christian radio station is safe for the whole family, as if that is, is the goal of it all. As long as we're safe, we're okay. No, 
We need to worship God. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Where's my thingy, my jiggy? All right. And then, and then what? Lord, I trust thy mighty power. Wondrous are thy works of old. We'll get back to this. Wondrous are thy works of old. No, actually, let's do it now. Lord, I trust thy mighty power. What is the source of that trust in this stanza? You believe God's mighty. You trust in that mighty power. And why is that? How have you come to that deal? Well, here would be because he's done so much in the past. Good. It, 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 it gives them the faith to trust him to move forward in the future. Yes, that's it. And not even necessarily your own past. Right? It, it's not... It's works of old, right? Isn't that cool? Yeah, so it's not even just my life that I look back on. It's works of old, like the Exodus, like the provision in the promise, into the promised land. So I love, guys, do you realize how important these two lines are for Christians? Lord, I trust thy mighty power. Wondrous are thy works of old. Liz. If one life, yeah. ah, so a whole single human existence could be one of the dark threats. Yes, and looking at the works of old or looking at the whole tapestry, you can see okay. that God has been providing, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the one dead in the past needs to be dead. Okay. We need the dark ones to okay. be the light ones to come back. To. Yeah, and, and some individual lives are far darker than others. What a, what a good way to put it. Good. Thanks, Murray. We should send him a tip. Um, good. Yes. I, I really want us to think about this for, for a bit. Lord, I trust thy mighty power. Wondrous are thy works of old. So what this is saying is, is God, you have provided for thousands of years. We have the stories that we go back to and we gain trust from those stories. Do you realize how hard this is for us today in our culture? What do you think may be warring against an ability to trust in works of old in our culture, in the way we think about life and reality and meaning and experience? What, what obstacles are there to being able to be those kinds of people? Okay, there, there's a, a push to trust in ourselves, good. So before, so we don't even depend on something outside of ourselves. Good, what else? All that ben. matters is right now. Yeah, good. All that matters is right now. There's such an emphasis on immediate experience. Good, keep going. Liz. Um, technology has taught us that the old is obsolete. Yes, now yes, 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 bad. yes, yes. All that matters is right now, and old is out, old school. Oh man, don't sing that song, it's three years old. <laughs> right? There's this, um, this emphasis on, on the newest is a, obviously the best. Good. Good, so it's not just the immediate in general, it's the immediate subjective. It's the immediate, just me. So not only do we not, do we not appreciate the past, we don't appreciate the past unless it's ours. But what's more fundamental to deepening Christian and developing Christian faith than the ability to step into the experiences of others and benefit from them? There's this basic assumption for Christians that we develop faith and hope and love and we perceive reality based on the experiences others have had with God. I mean, our whole faith, guys, 
is based on what? The testimony of the apostles and prophets. That's been handed down to us. We weren't literally at the foot of the cross, were we? But we were. And we weren't there when the Red Sea parted. But there's this assumption in the Bible that we are to derive as much faith from that Red Sea parting as the Israelites. And actually, in some ways, more. Because we've seen the fulfillment of that Red Sea parting like they hadn't. So I want you to realize that we're up against it in this basic assumption the Bible has, God has, toward the way we develop our faith. I mean, how often do you hear, hey, you can trust me because I've been there. In other words, don't take drugs because I was a drug addict, so I have authenticity. I have veracity to what I'm saying. As if you need to actually experience something firsthand to know truth about it. Now, I'm not minimizing how God can use testimonies, but I think we so overdo it and say, unless you've actually experienced something, you don't really know the truth and have credibility in, in regard to that truth. And that's not true at all from God's perspective. There's this basic assumption in the Bible, a massive assumption in the Bible, and we're instructed over and over again to glean from, to learn from, to deepen from the experiences of others. And you're not determined by your history only, you're, or at all. As a matter of fact, you can look to the histories of others and see your history as something that doesn't define you now. Because it didn't have to define people in the past. And we've got this idea that, well, my dad was an alcoholic, so what, what do you expect from me? The Bible never says that. The Bible doesn't say, well, your father was Manasseh, so of course we expect you to be evil too. No, there's a, you saw what happened to him. You should know better. You should have learned from that and broken that chain of sinfulness. And so there's this basic assumption that we build trust by his wondrous works of old. And that's what we're doing right now as we reflect on the Exodus as we worshiped with this hymn. This hymn helps us to derive faith, trust, from his wondrous works of old. Because the Bible are God's wondrous works of old. But I think there's this massive obstacle, this gap for us in our contemporary way of thinking that sees that as just the past. God used to work that way, that, that wow, they must have had a lot of faith because they saw God work that way. No, there's the, God assumes and, and knows that we have the ability to derive faith from the experiences of others. And not just in the Bible, but from the contemporary church too. That's why we need to know other people. To, to glean from the lives of other people and not just be left to our own. Good. Wondrous are thy works of old. And what are thy works of old? Here's the word, Aim. Thou deliverest thine from thraldom. Yes. Anybody know what, what thraldom is or thrall? Yes. Who said that? Yes, Chris. How do you know that word? Context. Yeah, context. Yeah, you just figured. Yeah, way to go. I bet you did well on your SATs. Yes. Um, Thy deliverest thine from thraldom. Yeah, it's, it's slavery. You, you took us out of slavery. Literally, in the context of our hymn, what is that slavery? Egypt. Egypt. Egyptian bondage. And speaking of a dark thread, like Liz said, speaking of a dark thread, imagine if you were one of God's people, not in the Exodus, but in the 400 years of Egyptian captivity longing for, awaiting that liberation. 400 years. What if you weren't one of the Israelites who took the promised land, but one in the 40 years of wilderness wanderings? What if you were one of God's faithful people in the 400 years of silence before John the Baptist showed up? We've got to be people who have the, what Liz was saying, that big picture perspective. But there's such an emphasis on immediate, subjective, personal experience that we actually lose out on our immediate, uh, subjective, personal experience because we can't glean from God's wondrous works of old. 
and be able to see sometimes our hard lives in light of the big thing God is doing. And it could be impossible for us to see how God could possibly use this for good because we're not backing up and see our, seeing our lives in light of the big story of God's perspective. And so in an effort for people to feel important, we overemphasize our subjective stories so that we un end up feeling unimportant because we're not a part of this massive story that's unfolding. And he delivers us from thraldom. He's been doing it since the Garden of Eden when he clothes his naked, shameful people he made. Uh, he delivers us throughout all of our history and he delivered you from the ultimate thraldom of sin and death and hell. You were, in, you were a slave to your own sin and now you're a slave of Christ and free in him. And here's the crazy thing about this slavery, who for naught themselves had sold. This, this is the, the tragic irony of the slavery that we sell ourselves into. You give everything and get nothing. Who for naught themselves have sold. You, you get nothing when you go down to Egypt for help instead of going to God. You get nothing when you go to the things of this world and pour your life into them instead of God. You give everything, you get nothing. And God offers just the opposite. You give nothing and get everything when you go to Him. And so, who for naught themselves at hold, here's the tragedy of it. And when you can see other people selling their souls for nothing in return, you can see the tragedy of it. But when we're the ones doing it, it's hard to see. You know, you think of Hosea. Remember when I was at Wheaton, some guys came to me and said, hey, let's do a Bible study. I said, all right, great. Let's study Hosea. I've been wanting to dig in there. And he said, Hosea, come on. Can we do something more immediately relevant, practical? I mean, what are, what? he's talking about worshiping raisin cakes. What is that? And it's so confusing. And, uh, so, but you read Hosea. You know the story? Hosea. Righteous man, go marry a whore, a prostitute. Go marry her. Her name's Gomer. Go marry her. And then he does it. And you know what she does? She sells herself right back into prostitution. And you know what God says to her? Go get her. Go buy your own wife back from the man who owns her. Do you know, I remember... <laughs> First time I really read that story, do you know what happened in my heart? I started reading that story and I started having feelings that you have for a friend who, who has a, a really bad boyfriend or girlfriend, right? It's like, man, Jose, have a little self-respect, man. You don't need her. Let her go. She doesn't deserve you. I started having those feelings for this poor guy. <laughs> and then I backed up and said, wait, the story is about Hosea and Gomer, and I'm not Hosea in this story. I'm Gomer. Like all of God's people, like Israel was imaged in that story then, and, and I changed my tune, and I said, Hosea, hurry! Go! She's an idiot! She doesn't know what she's doing! Go get her out of her idiocy! She's selling herself for nothing! She doesn't know it! Go, Hosea! Hooray! She's a fool! Trust me, I know! Yeah, thou deliverest thine from thraldom, who for naught themselves had sold. The <coughs> foolishness of it. And when we see our sin for what it is, sometimes five minutes after we've committed the sin, we see it for what it is, and we say, that was a whole pile of nothing that I just sold my soul for. But what does God do? Thou didst conquer. <laughs> thou didst conquer sin and Satan in the grave. You see, as bad as the Canaanites were, as bad as the Jordan River was as an obstacle, the Red Sea, the Egyptians, that's nothing. Those are just foreshadowings of the great enemy of sin and Satan in the grave. He conquers sin and Satan in the grave. What have we to fear or be anxious over? And then this great last stanza. Um, okay, guys, I, I want us to Ponder this line. Lord, I trust thy mighty power. Wondrous are thy works of old. This book is full of God's wondrous works of old. 
And I think we so easily find them irrelevant because we, we've been contaminated by a culture that sees things of old as irrelevant. Things that happen to other people and not you as irrelevant. Actually incapable of providing anything meaningful for you. They're fancy, actually, philosophical and historiographical. Uh, historia there are historiographies that, that say just that thing. It's called Lessing's Ditch or uh, the, the Gadamer's view of history. That, that, yeah, that history is just history. It has nothing to do with you. Existentialism sa says that sort of thing. So, so we not only believe this on a popular cultural level, there are, there are philosophical systems and ways of viewing history that are embedded in our culture that make this book irrelevant to us. And we, we read the, the Exodus and we say, yes, so what does that have to do with me? It has everything to do with you. Wondrous are his works of old. And God becomes a man lives a perfect life for 33 years and then dies a death on a cross and bursts out of the tomb and conquers sin and death and hell in the grave. And then people say, well, if God really wanted me to know him, he would write my name in the sky. No wondrous are his works of old. They really are sufficient to know him. We really do have a sufficient scripture. And so I want us to think about how hard it is for us because we will be basing our understanding of this God and deepening our trust in him, not just his mighty power, but everything about him, primarily based on his wondrous works of old. So if you don't uh, transform your way of thinking out of a cultural way of thinking that you've inherited, it's going to be really hard, really hard. This is the same God at work today in your life that accomplished these wondrous works of old. So that's what we need to do and, and be so rebellious against our culture. I, I think Christians are called to be massive rebels, not by doing silly things, but by deciding that history really can transform your life when you understand that it's the same God at work today. We're not going to get sucked into a culture. We're going to rebel against it and be able to be gleaning great faith from what God's done in the past. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.